All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, Yoga Beyond the Asanas. We're looking at the eight limbs of yoga. And we've talked about this already. When I took teacher training, I was like, it's asanas, that's it. I came in so I could be better at yoga. And to me, yoga meant asanas. And then um, after, when I started teaching in teacher training, it really came out that like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, the... Asanas are not just yoga. Yoga is eight limbs. Asana is one of the eight limbs. So we're looking at the very first limb, which is the yamas. Okay. <laughs> now, when we look at the yamas, what we know is the yamas are thought of as like restraints or things not to do to live your life. Right. So what does that or things not to do to live a meaningful and purposeful life? So what does that mean? So what I thought is that I'm going to read from Mukunda Styles, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And the reason I'm picking him is because he's very like blunt and to the point. He doesn't have like explanations because he translates them so skillfully. So if we're looking at the yamas, first and foremost, the sutras say here in 2.29 that yoga's eight component parts are self-control. So Makunda calls it self-control as a yama um, for social harmony, self-control for social harmony, precepts for personal discipline, that's the niyamas, the yoga pose, which is the asana, regulation of prana, which is pranayama, withdrawal of the senses from their objects, that is pratyahara, contemplation on our true nature, which is dharana, meditation on the true self, which is dhyana, and then being absorbed in spirit, which is samadhi. So we're looking at the yamas today. So 2.30 says that self-control consists of five principles. So there's five yamas, five niyamas, the 10 commandments of yoga. So self-control consists of five principles, non-violence, truthfulness, freedom from stealing, behavior that respects the divine as omnipresent, and freedom from greed. 2.31 says these are called the great universal vows, and when they're extended unconditionally to nurture everyone, regardless of status, place, time, or circumstance. So this means that they apply to everyone, no matter what, whatever, if you do this, then you can live a meaningful and purposeful life. Um, 2.33 says, when you're disturbed by unwholesome negative thoughts or emotion, cultivation of their opposites promotes self-control and firmness in the precepts. What I love about this is like, literally, this is a core belief, a core base foundational teaching of any personal development it's like find out what the stories are in your head find out what you're thinking find out what you think about yourself and then think the opposite because usually you're not thinking from a place of love right you're thinking from a place of not love so here it's telling us something that we learn in personal development and this is from 10,000 years ago I love that negative thoughts and emotions are violent and that they cause injury to yourself and others regardless of whether they're performed by you done by others or you permit them to be done they arise from greed anger delusion or delusion, regardless of whether they arise from mild, moderate, or excessive emotional intensity. They result in endless misery and ignorance. Therefore, when you consistently cultivate the opposite thoughts and emotion, the unwholesome tendencies are gradually destroyed. This reminds me of not being political. I'm not a very political person. I have my opinions. I don't often share them. I don't like to argue. And I think you're entitled to your own. I don't want to change your mind, except on some of the things that I do. So I don't tend to like be very political. And when when my mom or my dad will say something that is like it is racist. I like and they don't mean to but that's not an excuse. So for the longest time, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't correct them. 
because for me, it's like, well, I mean, they're from a different time. Um, if I try to correct them, it just starts a whole thing. But when I started reading this, I thought, well, if I don't say something, then I'm perpetuating this. And my kids see that I don't stand up for the fact that I don't believe in what they're saying. I think they're miseducated. And I don't think that they, they think that right now that the awake, like the woke culture, the awakening culture is, um, is soft and stupid. <laughs> And I mean, like the, everybody is awakened to their own level. Even the woke culture still has spiritual bypassing and isn't awake in a lot of freaking places. But that's fine because what's happening is a movement to awaken us to what the fuck has been going on and been okay for a long time, which is not okay. And so it calls me in hearing this, it calls me to not only think the opposite but say something because it says here if they cause injury to yourself or others regardless if they're performed by you or by others they result in endless misery and ignorance so wow <laughs> that was an awakening for me in like actually saying things now one thing i need to do is heal myself <laughs> To be able to speak to my family in a way that I can say like, hey, like what I'm thinking of is um, one, I'm just going to plug in my computer. One experience in which uh, I, it's like the, the celebrating of Canada Day. See, this even makes me nervous to speak about it openly. And if I'm not, then I'm causing damage right? The celebration of Canada Day. Really, what this celebration is, is it's the celebration of colonialism. And it's the celebration of like, um, yeah, becoming a nation at the harm of people that were already a nation, right? So to me, it's a little bit like, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. Anyways, so <laughs> I'm talking about it. And I said that I wasn't celebrating Canada Day. And, and my family then kind of like, well, you know, what my grandfather did to somebody else's grandfather has nothing to do with me. And I'm like, well, it's not like it was you. That's true. Yet, you know, we have to change it. So by saying that a traumatized culture now has nothing to do with us because it's from something from years ago is literally washing your hand and it's causing misery and suffering. So I said that and, you know, I was surprised because I found compassion because I had been awakened in different areas as well. So I realized that people are ignorant just from a place of not knowing, not because they're assholes. <laughs> and that was a big awakening for me. So I have the opportunity now to educate in a kind way. And what that does is if the other person doesn't like it, that's fine. I'm not going to argue, but I know that from now on, they're probably not going to discuss this kind of stuff with me. And I'm really good with that, <laughs> like really good with not hearing you spout off stuff that I think is bullshit. So that's like my example of um, 2.34. And then we dive into what are the yamas? So I'm going to leave those for additional videos. <laughs> so in the next video, we're going to look at Yama number one, which is Ahimsa or nonviolence. Or maybe I'll just keep going. Yeah. Why don't I just go until I go? And then um, what I'm doing, I'm going to cut this, edit this part out, is I'm actually creating a free course for friction yoga. And then I'm going to put it together and make it like beyond the asanas so that we can start to understand as uh, yogis and yoga teachers more about the other eight limbs that don't seem to be like that included in our culture. So the, the first one is called ahimsa, and that translates to nonviolence. And what I love about ahimsa or nonviolence is the fact that it means like you're not just being not violent to other people. It means that you're treating yourself with that same respect. 
It also means that you're looking at the different microaggressions that you may have in your life towards yourself or others. Example, how are you on your yoga mat? Right. If you go to like a namaste yoga class, which you probably will never find me in, but let's say that you go to namaste and you're tired and you feel like you can't keep up. Are you saying mean things to yourself or are you being like, that's OK, girl, go into child's pose because <laughs> this is really important. It's about not being violent to sell. So the sutras here say by abiding in nonviolence, one's presence creates an atmosphere in which hostility ceases now this is really huge that means that you cultivate a space around you in which violence is not occurring i want to talk about deborah adele's the yamas and the niyamas and then we'll go and then we'll go i have a couple things uh cleared here and then you know within yoga it talks about like um not eating meat as nonviolence and and there's a lot of different things that you can look at like i said even the way that you talk to yourself and talk to others you know when you're out of imbalance your body is in dis-ease and so we're not meant to be violent anyways so um practicing gratitude is a way that you can help yourself to come out of a place of anger because even thinking angry thoughts about someone else that's violent that's violence, right? So um, the the one that I love right here is this. Here is a way that so many people are violent without even knowing that they're violent. And it's called worry. Now, how many times do you say, I'm worried? All right, listen to what Deborah Adele has to say about this. Worry is another way that violence gets masked as caring. Worry is a lack of faith in the other and cannot exist simultaneously with love. Either we have faith in the other person to do their best, or we don't. Worry says, I don't trust you to do your life right. Worry comes from a place of arrogance that I know better what I what should be happening in your life. Worry says, I don't trust your journey or your answers or your timing. Worry is fear that hasn't grown up yet. It's a misuse of our imagination, and we both devalue and insult others when we worry about them. I I can hear it because I've I've said this so many times in teacher trainings, and I get these like people, either mothers <laughs> constantly worry about their kids to tell me about like how I'm wrong. And then also kids whose parents are like helicopter parents that are always worrying about them. This is an excuse why a parent can meddle in a child's life. And I just want to throw it out there that like sit with this for a moment. That's damaging thoughts that you're sending to someone. All right. So I'm going to offer you some quiet questions for exploration. All right, that's your homework. Ultimately, we have just one moral duty to reclaim large areas of peace in ourselves, more and more peace, and to reflect it towards others. And the more peace there is in us, the more peace there will be in our troubled world. So I want you to practice courage by doing one thing daily that you wouldn't normally do. I want you to bring about your courage. I want you to do something even if it scares you because you can be scared and courageous at the same time. They're not dependent upon one another. So see if you can discern between fear and unfamiliar and watch what happens to your sense of self and how your relationships with others might be different when you're courageously stepping into unknown territory. So I thank you so much for joining. This has been a little discussion on Ahimsa, the first yama, which is the first limb of yoga. And I will see you next week with number two, Satya. And I'm just going to leave it there. All right. <laughs>